This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Simple pleasures, or even times of the purest happiness imaginable, juxtaposed against moments of almost indescribable pain. As I gaze across the table at my husband and my surviving son, I know with absolute certainty that the three of us, each in our own way, are moving forward and embracing life, which is what I truly believe Kieran would have wanted us to do. Valeria Tellis interviews Margaret Thompson, the author of the World Looks Different Now, a memoir of suicide, faith, and family. Margaret Thompson is an author and journalist whose world was forever altered the day her son Kieran took his life at the age of 22. A medic in the army, Kieran had been preparing for his first ever deployment to Afghanistan at the time of his death on August 28, 2010. Upon receiving the unthinkable news, Margaret and her husband Tim found themselves plunged into what can only be described as every parent's worst nightmare. Lifelong Christians, the couple held tightly to their faith, even as Margaret found herself wondering whether she, too, might someday choose to follow in the path her son had taken. In desperation, Margaret turned to writing, which had long been a constant in her life as a means of focusing her mind and organizing her thoughts. In itself relatively simple, the act of putting pen to paper, or fingers to keyboard, served almost as a form of therapy, eventually bringing more solace than Margaret had ever thought possible. A professional journalist whose work has appeared in a variety of media outlets in the U.S. and Britain, Margaret relied on her journalistic training in her search for the deeper truths that she felt certain were lying behind her son's death. I was determined to put on the armor of the journalist, in the hope that doing so would give me at least a degree of emotional distance, Margaret says, which was extremely foolish of me, since there is, of course, nothing in the world that can protect you when it comes to dealing with your own intensely personal loss. Margaret Thompson and her husband Tim live in the greater Nashville, Tennessee area. Margaret is a journalist who's worked in both print and broadcasting. Her written work has appeared in a number of British and American publications, while her radio reports have been heard on broadcast outlets including ABC Radio News, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and National Public Radio. Meet Margaret at margaretreillythompson.com. Here is the interview with Margaret Thompson. In your own words, who is Margaret Thompson? Oh, Margaret Thompson is a, a wife and a mother. That's how I think of myself, first of all. And I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist really all my life since I was a child. I was one of those individuals who loved reading, writing, starting newspapers, writing for newspapers, that sort of thing. But of course, I identify first as a mother and as a wife. I wonder if some of us women who choose or can't have children, are we missing something in this life? Oh, that's a difficult question. But I think, you know, I could have easily been one of those women who did not have children because I was in a very demanding profession for a long time, which was a network journalism, high-level journalism, sort of int international journalism, yeah, if you like war correspondence type of journalism. And that does not lend itself to home life, to marriage, to children. It's I've seen other women go through that too. I can only speak for that profession because I was only in that profession. 
but I, I could see them struggling as well. How can you have it all? No, you can't really have it all. Can you do it? Who's, who's going to lose out? So there was a lot of that struggle and push-pull, and, and I experienced it myself. And, and my mother was a very rare professional. She was a uh, doctor at a time in the 19. 19- well, 50s even, or 60s, uh, when women were not doctors. And she was, I saw her as a role model who was that that woman who said to me through her behavior and even through her words, she said, you can have it all. And I always questioned whether that was really true. And no, in the end, my quick story to sum it up is, no, for me, I couldn't because of various extraneous events that happened, I literally had to choose between my older son and my career. And I chose, I chose my son, of course, and then later uh, was happily remarried and had another child. But it was just all too too demanding to do the same kind of career that I'd been doing. So, yeah, that's an interesting um, perspective coming from experience that we cannot have it all. Yes, that really resonates because we do try to have it all. And that maybe in that trying, we ended up feeling not fulfilled and accepting might be the way. I think so. I think a lot of times we women, I don't know where we're told this or where we learned this, but culturally we're told we can have it all. And it's kind of a, it can be a kind of a cruel message. So, but I think women without children, they, they may always wonder, well, did I miss out? But they may have gained in other respects uh, because they didn't have to go through that push pull or they were able to have a different type or different level of satisfaction in other areas and my next question is about the purpose of the human experience what do you feel that is if there is one oh i think it is to make meaning out of the world uh make sense make and also from a religious point of view, I think for a Christian, it is to glorify God and worship him forever. That's that's what we as Christians believe our fundamental purpose is. But for me, it's like when my son died, and in my book, my memoir, The World Looks Different Now, I, I'm literally organizing words on the page as if you're kind of just shuffling them around, (laughs) trying to make sense out of what is the most senseless act that anyone can do, which is to take their life, because he, he took his life, my older son took his life at the age of 22. And that was how I dealt with it, was to just slowly process and work through it. So I believe that that making meaning is very, very important. Trying to reach that meaning, sift through and find a meaning, not not impose, not impose of artificial meaning, but to dig down, to dig down while all the time protecting yourself psychologically, but to dig down for mm. that meaning and yet stay mentally healthy at the same time. And that's challenging. So true. Yeah, it sounds to me. That's another experience I never had. But yeah, I have interviewed so many people, mothers who have lost their children and fathers too. And it can be felt how powerful that is, that experience is. So how did you make sense of that, Margaret? Or what meaning did you give to that event? Well, I'm not sure I ever really could get could get to it. I think it started as a quest for answers. You know, if that, if suicide hits your life, a loved one takes their lives, you start questioning, you question yourself, you, you start even, you're so shaken by it. Fundamentally, it's your sense of self is completely disrupted. Your identity is shaken. If you were the mother, if you were the father, you were the spouse, you're now suddenly a widow, a widower, and and it happens so suddenly. That's 
that's also an aspect of suicide. It's in the same sense that, uh, say, a traffic accident would be. It's a very sudden loss. So that shuffling and that reorganizing in your mind, uh, it, it starts very suddenly and very abruptly. And then as far as searching, then there was the search for answers. So there was the inner search into myself. Who was I? Who was I? How do you be a mother who's lost a child? How can you, you know, organize yourself into that person? Because I was raging. A person says, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person who's lost a spouse or a sister or brother. I don't want that identity. I don't want them imposing that identity on me. I want to keep my old identity. But after that search, of course, there was a lot of the more practical searching of why did this happen? Why did my son take his life at this particular time? What were the hints? What were the clues? So that was where I started playing detective. And it gave me, actually gave me something <laughs> to cute. do. Yeah. And writing gave me, writing gave me something to do. So he was in the army. So like putting on a suit of armor, I put on my reporting clothes, outfit, you know, in my mind, I had the the pencil and the notebook, reporter's notebook. And I literally interviewed people from the army, either in person, over the telephone and asked a lot of questions about why do you think this happened? What are the army's policies? What did they do right? What did they do wrong? He was, my son, Kieran, was a medic in the army and he was about to be deployed to Afghanistan in uh, the fall of 1990. It was 11 years ago. And uh, so I felt the Army did not handle a lot of things correctly. And it was really easy to latch on to the Army and say, oh, the Army, they're the bad guys. I really, I really hate them and they're really at fault. And that's what you need. If you're, you need it in that moment, if you're the suicide loss survivor and this has just happened to you and you're trying to integrate a lot of very shocking material into your brain and into your psyche, you need somebody to get, or some entity, you need something to become angry with. But, you know, in a, a part of my mind I always knew it wasn't really the army's fault and they weren't, they weren't totally to blame, but they, they did not handle some things correctly. And my army, my book has received some support from the army, but it's also received some criticism um, and lack of publicity from the army because it's not entirely complimentary. And then the third part of the search for meaning was to see if there is meaning in the concept of suicide as a as a concept. You know, if you can separate yourself from the horrible reality that this has happened in your own life can you can you think about suicide in an abstract way does it a question i ask myself a lot is can suicide destroy hope does it destroy hope in the suicide loss survivor and i can't i can't totally answer it i mean i think some we, we want to believe that something good can come out of anything, everything, if you, if you can find something. Maybe my book. Maybe my book was that one good thing because I was working on another book at the time, and I set it aside, and then I, I wrote this. I wrote The World Looks Different Now, and I always, you know, wondered, would, would I have ever finished it? Would I finish? I'm going back now and trying to finish the other one. But would I have ever been driven enough, you know, motivated enough to finish it? But it, it I'm not going to say that suicide's not a very challenging thing. I, I believe for all of the suicide loss survivors. And, and if you look at the facts and figures, suicide is increasing across the board. We don't know also how much the pandemic has caused it yet. We don't know yet, or the people who keep statistics don't know yet, what are the effects uh, that may be caused by the pandemic. But the numbers are rising. 
uh, close to 50,000 Americans a year. And if you think, say there's seven people close to that person who takes their life, then there's, say, 350,000 people who are affected in the United States every year by suicide. As you know, people come up to you and say, that happened in my family, and it was my son or my sister or my brother. It's it's very common now and a commonplace that's not to normalize it. We should never become you know, complacent or just say, oh, that treat it in a casual sense. But it is affecting more than 54 percent of all of um, all Americans. So that is potentially a big audience for my book. But of course, the books on this topic are very, very difficult to get published. And the subject, it, even according to a fairly recent Washington Post article that it, it's it said this it's a subject we are silent on as a nation that's a quote it is shrouded in shame and fear yeah and i wonder why is there something connected to the idea of who we are is that challenging the belief systems of what we are capable of because that seems like the unimaginable, to be able to have the drive to take one's own life, it goes against survival mechanism. So yeah. it's not courage. It cannot be, right, Margaret? Some people, they say that I have heard, oh, he or she had the courage to do that. But it's not courage. It can be. It's fear, isn't it? Yes, it can be. I think that's one of the greatest mysteries of suicide is there's always the why or how could they do it or how could they how could they even get into that frame of mind and in mind and in in my book I write about trying to enter my son's mindset you know his state of mind trying to I retrace different places that he goes and I retrace the evening that he goes out and takes his life. And I know this sounds incredibly dark, but I really try to get the reader to come along with me on this. It's a literal journey. And I, I go to the place where he took his life. And I think sometimes for suicide loss survivors, it's very important to to know things or to see things or to re-experience, to experience what they experience. But even though I experienced all this, I could not enter that mindset. I even tried to contemplate taking, taking my own life. And I know that I can't do it, but I don't. And that's what I think a lot of us don't understand. And that's the mystery of suicide is who enters that mind frame, frame of mind. Why do they enter that frame of mind? And it's such a mystery, even for the greatest researchers in the field. They can't they they can't really know because they say completers or people who complete suicide could be a totally different population from the people who attempt. So if you study the attempters, who are the only ones who are alive, that may not give you the full picture. And then there's there's the issue of if we if all of the things that have been set in place to try to prevent suicide, such as helplines, which I'll mention I'll mention one specifically in a moment, but the helplines, the therapy, the all the different things that that are out there, they say they're only nine percent effective. I don't know how they come up with that right exactly, but they're they're relatively ineffective at preventing suicide. So those who are campaigning to prevent suicide, and all of us certainly want that, they're they're finding that the tools they think should help or not really helping that much. It's interesting, you talked about, you said the word darkness. I have been reflecting about this idea lately, ah, that it seems like we human beings, we are very dark in general. And 
it's the light that we need. So sometimes when the light can't reach our thoughts and our hearts, then it's really challenge to be happy, to be at peace. And I'm wondering if that has something to do. So the more light, light being this metaphor for accessing this part of us that it's so beautiful and open and curious about everything that asks questions without mm-hmm. judgment. That could be one component of what we need as human beings, not just people who have mental illnesses or commit suicide or people who harm themselves in so many different ways with drugs. Somehow we always connect spirituality to those ideas of living in the light. So talk to me for a moment about what spirituality is to you and how was your Christian faith affected as a result of your son's suicide? Yes, I I wrote the subtitle of my book, The World Looks Different Now, is a memoir of suicide, faith, and family, because it, it kind of touches on all three of those elements. And I was brought up in a traditional Christian home, and but not strongly religious, although my present husband and I met in church as children, and then we met again much later. He, he became the stepfather to my older son, the one who took his life. And so it was very meaningful to us that we were eventually reunited as adults through our childhood church. But during that time, I had, as say, 20s, early 30s, like a lot of young people, I'd kind of fallen away from the church or grown away from the church. And a lot of it, too, was a journalism background or working in journalism. We always had to work on Sundays or I work quite often on Sundays. Now that's quite common. But but back then, a lot of people took Sunday off. And uh, so I kind of it kind of drift. I kind of drifted away from it. But I went through very, very challenging divorce when my older son, Kieran, was, say, around four years old. And that kind of drew me back to my faith. I was living in England at the time. He was born in England. It's not a very conventionally religious country any longer. But uh, I did turn, I did go back to church at that time, partly because like I, said, I was inundated with problems. And I think then, then my present husband and I, we raised both of our sons in the church. And he had a my husband has a strong Christian faith and strong Christian practice and of praying. We pray together. We prayed with our boys. I think it was very important when when Kieran died that we had our church. As conventional as it was, it was it's a very conventional church. It in in it and the church didn't behave perfectly. It was like the situation with the army. I became angry with my church and some of the people in it because I didn't think they reacted very well or they weren't they weren't there for me. They weren't there like you think they're going to be. But uh, you you mentioned something about this earlier about maybe the the taboo the, there's such a great taboo on suicide against suicide in terms of its it's often called the last taboo. Again, this, this, why don't we talk about it? Why can't we face up to it as a nation, as a world, that this is a big problem? Well, it, it may have to do with those cultural prohibitions relating to certain religions, and Christianity is one of them, that in the early years of Christianity, there was a very strict prohibition against suicide. And it, it's just amazing that that could have been 17, 1800 years ago, and yet it still, it, it still, I believe, could, can have an influence on how people react to the subject of suicide or when someone experiences a suicide, like a neighbor, they, they might shun that neighbor. They might be afraid to go over to the neighbor's house and, and talk with them. And you would think in this day and age, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have that issue. But, but as far as the church, I was very happy that it was there 
for me and for us and for our family in the sense that it's made of human beings, the churches. It's those human beings do not always behave exactly like <laughs> you might want you might want them to at all moments. But it it was helpful to us that we had rituals to go through when it came to having uh, services, and a Christian funeral and burial. So. I touch on it in my book, but I wouldn't say mine is like, quote, a Christian book. It is not categorized in the religion section or the Christian nonfiction section. That's not how it's categorized. It's categorized as memoir because I just wanted it woven in. I didn't want to be boxed in in a little corner of this is a Christian book. I I wanted to be... This is kind of, I took my faith for granted, so I fell back on it at times. I got angry about it at times. I got angry at God. I mean, I think you can easily say a person could have that kind of devastating experience and they could reject, they could reject God and the religion and their religious teachings. They, they could, I could, I could imagine that happening probably has happened with me in in at times but i know it's there it's there for me it's it's still an important foundation in my life what is your idea of god where what and who is god to you margaret well i believe that i don't believe in the old testament god so much <laughs> yeah. i don't believe in an yeah. angry vengeful <laughs> god which yeah. uh it is certainly part of the Christian Bible in the Old Testament. But I believe that uh, God and Christ view situations with compassion. And I think the anger that from in me could come, why God, why didn't you stay his hand? Why, Why didn't you prevent that? Because well, I believe God very powerfully intervened in my son's life uh, to keep him safe for a very long time. But at that moment, a different decision was made either by my son or by God or the two in conjunction with one another, where, of course, we as Christians also believe we have we have free will. God does not manipulate us like puppets. So I don't know if I strayed too far from your question. (laughs) (laughs) No, uh, no, no, no. I do have this idea about God as unconditional love Mm -hmm. that holds the space for everything, what we call good and bad. It just accepts and holds everything, embraces everything. There's no discrimination and judgments. It's almost like we are here to experience this, however it unfolds. And that's a a very open way of thinking about life and spirituality itself. That's how it comes to me, the, the message of what this is that we call life. It's just a dance of unconditional love. Mm-hmm. Um, which is very challenged to understand with the mind, a mind that always tries to label everything and try to find safety in everything. So that's such a challenging idea to hold, that it's okay to have both. It seems to me, Margaret, that the only way you can have this experience in the human body, to experience both dark and light, how could we, we experience joy and, and love without the other side? there would be nothing to really compare with. So there wouldn't be love as well. So that's what it comes to me every time. But it's it's an open idea that I often talk here to and we kind Mm -hmm. of discuss. (laughs) Would you like to add anything or make any comments about that? Yes, it it really inspires me to say that the, and sometimes I've thought this, trying to keep gratitude in uh, my mind at all times, thinking, yes, I have had a very dark experience, and others have too many, as I've mentioned, uh, hundreds of hundreds of thousands now in the United States have, have 
who become suicide law survivors, so they carry with them this very dark experience. But maybe God wanted me to have that experience for a reason. When I totally agree with what you're saying, Valeria, that, that light, we can't have just all light and sunshine and, and everything bright uh, every every single day. Uh, it does seem that so that I have a particularly heavy, dark experience to carry, as do so many other survivors who I've spoken to, or they've they've come to me and told me about their experiences, or they've told me they've read my book. That we carry this experience, but maybe we can find again meaning. Maybe we can make something positive out of it, or we've we're carrying it for a reason. And for me, it's not just to, it's not to write a book. And I don't think that's the end all be all of everything. It it could be just, just to connect with another person who's had a similar experience and, or just even it's God has given me the gift of the insights, the insights of the experience. The experience is very dark, but it carries insights with it that, that have value, I believe. I love the way you say that a lot about the meaning, finding that meaning that um, that will somehow sustain that idea of gratitude, the feeling of gratitude and carrying on with this experience of life. What comes to me is that that is already built in within the human being, that we have that ability, that capability too, of course, of thinking, reflecting, abstract thinking especially which is, has to do with the light to me when I think about abstract thinking, that we can see the big picture go beyond what is happening or what has happened. Uh, so it's beautiful the way you speak too. I love how genuine you are. The sound of your voice reflects that. So thank you. It's really beautiful. Thank you. And you mentioned, uh, I, I just wanted to add, you, you mentioned the, uh, we, we think about the suicidal person. We, you know, try to get into their heads and without endangering our own mental health, but just, and I'm not saying they're mentally ill. Half the people who take their lives are classified not suffering from a mental illness. Now they may be suffering from depression. It's suicide is often associated with depression and or substance abuse but a, one a therapist told me that the number one predictor of suicide, I don't know whether this is true, but that was her uh, a take on it, is feeling trapped, feeling trapped by circumstances, being trapped in life where you can't make changes in areas you want to make changes in. And so that that could be that could be a factor, but certainly, the individuals go and get into a very, very dark place. And I had written something down about about that, about rumination, because I used writing for healing, and I didn't know what I was doing. I, didn't, I was just like, I, I'll write. You know, it's something I'm used to. I'm used to is expressing, not creative writing so much as journalistic writing. So journalistic writing is a little bit maybe drier, it's a little more objective. It's just, well, how can you be objective about your child uh, taking their life? That's that's crazy. You can't be. But it's trying to step back. And so what I did was try not to fall into the trap of ruminating because ruminating leads to anxiety, which leads to depression and kind of this downwards and box-like thinking. And I I do believe that a lot of people who take their lives end up in that kind of uh, tight, circular thinking, and and it inhibits their ability to find solutions to their issues, their problems. So I I just wanted to say that, that yes, we know they're in a very dark place. We know they may feel trapped. Uh, But if you're going to write, and there's a lot, uh, there are a lot of studies that show that certain types of writing can help. You don't want to get into that kind of, you know, state of mind and don't fall into the ruminating. 
ruminating means ruminating means thinking negative thoughts without being able to formulate solutions, basically, and thinking negative thoughts about yourself and then getting into the anxiety leading to the depression and so on and so forth. That seems to be a big one for all of us in general, trying to trying to deal with that voice that's very critical, my right? inner voice that's always criticizing ourselves for everything we do. The work I do, it's all about self-love, and I even go further to call it unconditional self-love. And that has to do mm -hmm. everything to do with being open and curious. Oh, I'm having this thought now. Interesting. <laughs> everything becomes an interesting mm -hmm. idea and a playground. It's almost like a childlike kind of mind. It has helped me a lot because I had depression. I had issues with that for a long time. And I remember naturally going back to playfulness and trying to bring that light into my own head. And although at some point I couldn't do it and I did have suicidal thinking too, and that was the moment that I changed my life completely. Okay. Yeah. And that makes sense about feeling trapped. That's how I felt. And then I made change immediately at that point when the thought of taking my own life came in. And that's when, okay, I have to change the way I'm living. I have to live in a different way, the way I want to live. And that's when everything mm -hmm. changed. Oh my God, Margaret, everything changed. That was about almost 10 years ago. I'm so glad you were able to make those changes. Yeah, it was not easy. Had It's interesting how sometimes we have to, I don't know why we let thoughts control our lives. Negative thoughts, they literally control everything. And I remember from so many years just letting that, my life being controlled, be driven by fear, basically. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's mm -hmm. step by step, isn't it? I love the idea of talking about, that's why this podcast really helps, talking about topics like this. It creates this door so we can be more open as not just as parents, I think, because most of the people who commit suicide, they are young people. It's definitely, it's definitely uh, increasing in that demographic. Uh, young women, the percentage has doubled since the year 2000. And most of that is attributed to screen time and social media. That, that has been one of the largest, one of the largest increases since the year 2000. Uh, men, in the 45 to 64 year old range, they they still make up a quarter of the suicides. But I, I agree with you that we're we're talking, and that's that's so important that that you've initiated this discussion and you've you're you've not shied away from it. But again, like I say, it's still considered a taboo. And I think one of the reasons it's so taboo is that one of those myths, and there are a lot of myths about suicide, but one of them is that talking about suicide increases the risk of it occurring. And the research has shown that that is incorrect and that it is correct to ask a person if they are feeling suicidal. It, it is not likely more, or more likelier to make it, to make it occur, but it is just a, a persistent, a persistent myth. So, I mean, I will just take this moment to say there is a, na the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline in case I don't remember to say that at the end, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-TALK, T-A-L-K, TALK. And that is also 1-800-273-8255. And so that is a 24-7 uh, number nationwide. It, there are others, of course, in your in different areas of the country, local numbers. If, if, if anyone is listening to this and they feel they need to process some difficult emotions, they should certainly, they should certainly call that number. But this is, again, not to say, not to feed into that myth that, uh, Valeria, you and I having a discussion about my memoir 
about suicide that that is hopefully that that is not going to contribute to to anyone taking their lives. It's just there's so much fear and there's so much cultural there's so much of that cultural taboo that may go back to different different religions is one of the reasons that uh, were had prohibitions against it for you know more than for thousands of years and you know that's you don't know if that's why someone doesn't come to the door when something like this happens or maybe they do or you know I've talked to people who've had so many different experiences um, they had an outpouring of support I've talked to other people oh I didn't I didn't have any support so the circumstances are so different and I just feel I was very blessed with the people who did appear in my life. They, they didn't have to be just huge numbers of people, but the people who did were, I felt just sort of placed there or when they appeared and they offered the right help at the right time, it just, it just felt like such a blessing. It, it didn't need to be thousands of people, but that's what I touch on in the book. Yeah, thank you so much, Margaret, for the work you do, the way you express that message. It's really beautiful. It can be felt, not just heard with the words that you're speaking, but the sound of your voice, the way you speak in the words. Um, thank you for caring. It's really, really beautiful. Again, I keep saying that because it is this idea of helping ourselves and others at the same time. So you wrote the book, The World Looks Different Now, a memoir of suicide, faith, and family. Would you like to read a passage in your book? I will. Let me just open it here. Yes, I will, uh, I will read from chapter one. The phone call that changes everything comes in January 2009. I'm standing in the kitchen, a dish towel in one hand. Hey, Mom, guess what? I did it. I'm in. Instantly, I'm aware of a roller coaster sensation deep in the gut, of, deep in the pit of my stomach. I want to believe that everything is going to be all right, even though I feel certain that joining the Army is one of those life-altering decisions that cannot easily be undone. You mean you've enlisted? I can hear myself trying to sound suitably upbeat. Yep, it's a done deal. I'll be leaving for basic in a couple of months. Well, honey, you know I'm happy for you if you're sure this is what you want. Don't be silly, Mom. Of course it's what I want. My grip tightening on the phone, I think back to how I'd woken up early that morning to the stark realization that today was the day, the day I'd been dreading for months. Still lying in bed, I'd imagined my son leaving his in-law's house more than 200 miles away. I'd imagined him driving through the early morning darkness on his way to the MEPS, the place he'd told me about. It's where you go, Mom, when you want to enlist. I'd lain there wide awake and worrying, partly because I'd remembered Kieran telling me that he was concerned about reaching the MEPS on time and without getting lost. And now he's telling me that he's in, that he's been accepted into the United States Army. Ah, oh, you're a great writer, too. Um, I love the picture you have of you and him when he was little. That's on your website. You have many pictures. Oh. Yeah, I love that. Thank one. you. And then, yeah, well, I mean, that just brings a lot of emotions, although I, it's interesting how connected we all are. Uh, that's what comes to me, too. Yes. Because it can be felt, yeah, that pain, the, um, that love and the pain, uh, both. Uh, so how do you define success these days? What is to be successful to you? Oh, I think to make change, in individual change, even just just one-on-one, -on -one, just just speaking to a person, having them speak to you, sharing a thought, an idea, trying to understand someone who does not share your thoughts, your ideas, trying to be open to them, just meeting every single person where they are, not not trying to be on TV, not trying to to write a book, <laughs> just, just <laughs> yeah. to, just to be present, really be present in the world. And some of the things you, 
you said just resonate so closely with me, just kind of being open to experiences and, and, and not trying so hard to control. Yes, a billion times, <laughs> a trillion times mm-hmm. to that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, not trying to control everything because most of this cannot be controlled of what life is. What is another word for grief? Well, I always think of sorrow, of course, and I'm sure there must be some different, the words are different slightly in uh, in meaning. I think I probably have looked them up. <laughs> yeah. I've looked up every word I used in that book to make sure I was using it correctly. <laughs> uh, probably, mm-hmm. you know, sorrow you think of, I think is more long lasting, deeper, is something you carry with you. And it's awfully hard, and a lot of us don't like to think about it, that that we may have or we already have sorrows in our lives that that we must shoulder every day to a certain extent. And we must, and we do, we find joy, hopefully, and we get to a place where uh, we're, we're stronger, we're more resilient. We're able to find we're able to find joy. Grief, I think, is obviously it's more more acute, more of a plunging situation where you're plunged down into something, and you have to you have to kind of wait. It's it's can be so extreme. You can't shake it off. You can't. You're you're not in control. You have to you have to accept it. You have to accept that it, it's going to take time. I mean, the book, a friend of mine says, time, time is your friend. And I say back to her, I think to myself, oh, that is so, you know, mundane to say something like that. But then later in the book, I said, well, that it was, there was a certain amount of truth in that, you know, and now I could say after 11 years, it's not, it's obviously it's not as acute, but it's always with me, and I think that can be somewhat that can be somewhat frightening. Is that you always you always have to you always carry it carry it with you. Yeah. Uh, wow, and that it's amazing how it changes us. And I see that I have people around me, although I have not experienced grief. My husband has; he lost his sister. And I can see that, Mm. how he changed. It's Mm -hmm. transformed in a way. Uh, So let me ask you this question, similar to the other one. What another word would you use for healing? Is there a destination for grief? Healing as a destination? Yes, for grief, when it comes to grief. Yes. I think it's it's very gradual. Um, Another... Another word for it, it could be, it could be transformation was the first word I thought of, but gradual because the transformation, I think sometimes we think of sudden and very dramatic, but it could be, it could be a slow transformation. And, and that's what takes place in my book. And that's all I can illustrate in the world looks different now, I undergo a, an experience that is what you might call transformational. It's physical. It's um, It literally gives me a new perspective physically on the world. And that's why the title is The World Looks Different Now. It, I came up with that title before the pandemic, but uh, in some ways it seems to apply to the pandemic. So I wrote a little epilogue about that. But uh, I think a transformation on the journey, a, a, a walking or moving down a path, you're, you're going somewhere. So in, in the book, I have this transformation, say, three quarters of the way through the book. And then it ends, and it's about four years after my son Karen died. But it's an artificial ending. You know, that's what, that's what I wanted to say. Books have to have, like movies too, they have to have endings, and they're somewhat artificial because the progression and the journey and the healing still continues, of course. I'm, I'm sure you know it continues. It continues even today, the journey. But it, it is kind of artificial, but it's yet true that there can be along that 
journey, there some transformational experiences take place, you know, where you experience um, bursts of healing, sudden healing, and then maybe plateau, and then maybe slow, gradual healing, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's not linear, right? And my last question is, what are three things you wish everyone to experience before they lose the body, before they die? Oh, I would love for everyone to experience pure joy, pure love, pure contentment, peace. I believe those are three things, maybe four. I don't know if peace and contentment acceptance might be interchangeable, just that freeing feeling of uh, not trying so hard to be in control, some acceptance. And I really do pray that for people and especially for people who've, who've lost loved ones and especially those who've lost loved ones through suicide. Thank you so much again, Margaret, for your presence here today, the work you do, the book they have written, and um, everything else in between that could be felt. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. And before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? I'm um, on the internet. I have a website. It's margaretrileythompson.com. And I'm also on Facebook, Margaret Riley Thompson. I used to write under my maiden name, so that's Riley in the middle, R-I-L-E-Y. Instagram, Margaret Riley Thompson, and Twitter, M. Riley Thompson. So I'm there, not too active, but I'm on those different available outlets. Wonderful. I'll have the links on your podcast profile, too. Thank you so much again, Margaret, and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Valeria. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Margaret Thompson and her work, please visit margaretrileythompson.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.